first wave begins with a bang, literally. It was total confusion. People are running every direction. I started going aft to go through those compartments, and gun lockers broke loose and they fell over. The ship was going over pretty fast. Everybody kind of was on for himself to get out. Oklahoma capsized within the first 10 minutes of the attack. As she did so, she trapped men aboard. There was no way to go anywhere else. We were there. That was it. Dear Bethany, thank you for the letter concerning JC. The letter brings back many memories of JC and our high school. I am very sorry he didn't have a chance at life. We just wanted him home. We felt like that was the right thing to do. To be able to lay him to rest next to the two people that loved him the most, his parents, it's absolutely priceless to us. The attack on Pearl Harbor is an event that reaches through more than seven decades, that reaches from the 20th century into the 21st century to admonish us to continue the good work of historical inquiry so that we can bring closure to surviving family members, so that we can understand what actually happened on December 7th. Pearl Harbor fits into that category of days in American history where there's a kind of a big before and after effect. For Americans, things are different on December 8th, 1941, than they were a few days earlier. In 1929, the happy boom days ended for us. The Depression was here. This was what the communists were waiting for. Since My mother was making the living for us, and uh, I got work in a, in a ditch with a pick and shovel. I decided when I got home that weekend, I'd go down and join the Navy. Your Navy needs you. Go to your nearest recruiting station today. My grandfather's name was John Charles England, and everybody called him JC. He spent most of his childhood uh, in Oklahoma City, uh, and evidently always wanted to serve aboard the, o the USS Oklahoma. J.C. enlisted in the spring of 1940 and was assigned to the USS Oklahoma Radio Communications. And he left on October 3rd, 1941. And he left on his wife, Helen, her 19th birthday. So she's eight months pregnant and just turned 19. My grandfather, Paul Andrews Nash, was one of the older crew members on the USS Oklahoma. Paul was from a farm family. I think he wanted to find a job, but was unable to because of the Depression. And he enlisted in the Navy in April of 1933. My brother Lowell was 18 years old when he enlisted. When he first tried to get in, they sent him home because he had enlarged tonsils, so he had to have his tonsils out and then go back in. So he went back in like in November of 1940. He was 19 years old when he went aboard the Oklahoma. When I got on the Oklahoma, I was 17 years old. 
I thought it might be a little easier when they got aboard ship. In the Navy, I knew I'd be washing the decks and all that, you know. But that is a lot easier than pick and shovel in a ditch. Before the war started, I thought it, thought it was great. It was a big ship. So the first week I was on it, I was all over the thing, just trying to get acquainted with different areas of the ship. And I kind of uh, liked it. Oh, I wanted to see the world. And I did, believe it or not. I remember Tickle Pinch going to Hawaii because I had never been there. At Pearl, uh, the weather was beautiful. And the smell, we could smell gardenias. Liberty started around 4, 35 o'clock. You didn't have money to take taxis, so they had a train. We called it the Chattanooga Choo Choo. It wasn't a big train, it was just a little sugar cane train. Most naval ships, even when they're sitting in a harbor in peacetime, will set a certain watertight boundary condition which will have some watertight boundaries closed, but allows for free passage around the vessel for the crew. We were going to have admiral's inspection on Monday. So we opened all the hatches, all the compartments, so he can inspect. This made the ship more vulnerable. However, there was a thought that if there's going to be an attack, it's not going to be an attack against the fleet anchorage. So there was some confidence in the idea that if the ship's compartmentalization is not secure, the ship will be OK. The Japanese picked Pearl Harbor for their attack because the entire fleet was concentrated in one small area. The Japanese assembled into what they called a mobile strike force. They called it Kido Butai. And it had never been done before. They assembled six carriers, two battleships, 10 destroyers and cruisers, and eight tankers. There was roughly 400 aircraft between the six carriers. It was the largest assembly of naval aircraft at one time. The battleships at Pearl Harbor were named after US states, Arizona, California, Utah, Nevada, etc. The Japanese recognized that sea power derived from the capital ships, the battleships. And so they focused on battleship row sinking these ships that represent our states, these ships that are really icons of national prestige, would deal us a blow from which the Japanese thought we would not quickly recover. These battleships are these huge 600 or more feet long vessels, all anchored right next to each other. Usually, the battleship squadrons would rotate so that they wouldn't all be in port at the same time. But it just so happened that they were all in port on December 7th. They were absolutely lined up like sitting ducks. I was fireman second class aboard the USS Ward. About 6.30, we get a general quarters call. The Antares thought that they had seen a periscope be behind them. Well, then about that time, Skipper says, load all guns, prepare. And then the ward moves in for the kill. Eventually, drops depth charges and knocks out this sub. They, of course, radio that they've engaged and sunk a sub. It's 6.45 AM. And you'd think in, that this would have set off alarm bells, but it apparently did not. As Japanese aircraft are flying toward Oahu, we're overlooking clues that would have tipped us off about what was about to happen. Japanese crewmen line the sides of the aircraft carrier and they're waving their hats and cheering. 183 planes takes off from all six carriers and they begin this massive formation with red and green running lights sparkling in the sky. They headed towards Hawaii, about 220 miles. The aircraft were picked up by American radar at about 136 miles out. 
but they were dismissed because there were B-17s coming in from California almost at the exact same time. In retrospect, you can connect the dots. You can say they should have known, but at the time, it's just a million dots. The Japanese are therefore able to, for the most part, catch us completely by surprise. Before the first wave hit, Mitsuo Fuchida, the commander in charge of the entire air operation, had to inform the fleet that they were successful. So as he was heading towards uh, Pearl Harbor, he realized that the Americans were caught off guard. So his radio man sent that famous message, Tora, Tora, Tora. Tora stands for Totsugeki. Totsugeki means attack, and Laigekitai means torpedo planes. So they took the first letter from To and Ra and Tora, and he repeated that for about a minute. I had a day off for liberty, you know, and going to chore. So I was shining my shoes, had my white slate out on my bunk. I had this date with a little Hawaiian girl. Of course, I didn't get there. JC's roommate and JC were in their room, and they were going over the duty roster of the day. This gentleman was on his way to breakfast, and JC was on his way to the radio room. Oh, I was reading a book in our compartment, where our bunks are located, just above the water line, in the midsection. First, they sounded the alarm, and everybody thought it was a drill on a Sunday. So there was a lot of foul language going on. The first wave split and went around the right side of Hawaii and attacked from the bottom. Meanwhile, they hit the airfields on the way in. And then, after knocking out several hundred US aircraft, they then move on the second primary target, which are these US battleships. Then the second announcement came over the speaker. He said, fellas, this is air attack, and this is no fellas. And boy, that brought us to our attention. It means you're not, I'm not fooling around. And about that time, the torpedo started hitting us. And it just felt like the ship was jumping out of the water. It would just go bang, 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 you know? The well, first thing I did was go down below decks. We were in this turret down in the pit when the first torpedo hit. You know, we started to go to a general quarters. One of the Japanese planes flew right down the port side of the ship, and I could see the pilot and the radio men laughing like everything. Mr. Yoshino was an aircraft commander, and as he entered target zone, they dropped to 30 feet off the water. We shouted for his pilot to rudder left, and they went after the Oklahoma. He said he could see the faces of the sailors looking at him, waving and running. And he had his hand on the, the lever to release the torpedo. As they got close, closer, he screamed, yoy, pick, and pulled the handle. And that dropped the torpedo. We all ran to our battle stations. Mine was in number four turret handling room, which was about three decks down. You're running, you're thinking about getting to your battle station, and you just lose track of the hits. I had to run at this passageway, then go down this ladder. Then another hatch, the ladder went straight down. Probably took me five or six seconds to get down there. I moved pretty fast in them days. I went down on a third deck, and that hatch is 13 and a half inches thick. And they started closing that hatch. I said to myself, I said, well, I've been trained to be a, a loader on an aircraft. Yeah, in case somebody gets hit or hurt, I could replace him. And I got out of there. As aerial torpedoes keep slamming into the ship, men are frantically attempting to escape from below deck. 
At the same time, the ship is being overwhelmed by water rushing in from the damage from the torpedoes. And the first instinct when the ship comes under attack is to establish watertight integrity by closing hatches so that flooding doesn't extend to other parts of the ship. Every time I went through a hatch, somebody else would dog it down. So I'm trying to... Oh. I'm trying to undog one, and the other guy on the other side beating it down. When I got down in the handling room, somebody spilled some oil on the deck down there. It was a steel deck all shined up. There were so many people down there, and they're all jabbering. Most of that was panic sounds, especially when they started slipping on that deck and couldn't get up. When JC got to the radio room, his men were all unconscious. And he revived one man and took him up to safety, and then went down, revived another man and went up, and went down a third time, brought another man up. Then all of a sudden, we got hit by three torpedoes. Boom, boom, boom. All heck broke through. I saw the planes diving everywhere, and machine gun bullets flying all over. And everything on the starboard side started breaking loose. Then an armor piercing shell came right through the top of our turret. So there was no easy decision on Oklahoma. No one could just make the easy, quick decision that gets them through the day without injury. Everyone had to make some direct confrontation with life and death. The majority of the damage that the Japanese inflict during the attack on December 7th that occurs during the first 15 minutes. The first wave split and went around the right side of Hawaii and attacked from the bottom. The second wave attacked from the opposite side. So it was almost this like simultaneous punch to the left jaw. And while the Americans are still reeling from that, they get hit again on the right side of their face. It was really a bad day for the Americans. As the ship was going over, I got a hold of the ladder that took us up through the turret. People were sliding on that deck and getting up against the bulkhead and couldn't make it up to the ladder, so we formed a chain. Give me your head! And the lights started going off and on. Finally, it went out all together. That was about uh, when they called the word to abandon ship. When they said abandoned ship, I don't even think it crossed his mind. I think he knew that he had men in his radio room that needed to get out, and he wasn't going to stop until they were all out. JC went down to the radio room a fourth time and then was never seen again. When I got out on the main deck, I realized how far she was over because I couldn't walk up the deck. We had a water hose coming from the beach to fresh water. To get up that slope of that deck, I, I used that water hose. We lost the chain, and uh, that's when I went up the ladder. As it was listing, I had to kind of go up the ladder sideways. You couldn't go straight up because it was over too far. For the men below deck in the turret, the only option is to move from handling room up into the main part of the upper turret and then exit this crew hatch that's on the aft part of the turret. This puts them out on the open deck where they actually have a fighting chance at survival. Finally, I seen daylight coming through that hatch, so I knew where I was at. I kept going, and then I jumped out that hatch. The ship was over quite a bit. I jumped in when I was in the water. I'd seen the West Virginia getting hit with torpedoes and bombs. That's when the fire started. As USS Oklahoma begins to die, there are men on the deck, and the men have to make critical decisions about survival. One of the decisions that they had to confront was the possibility of diving off the ship into the water below. It's a distance of almost 50 feet. 
There were men on board the deck of that ship that looked down on a water surface that was ablaze. And so they had to decide, should I stay here and die, or should I dive into that burning water? That fire just began to come down through the Oklahoma and the Maryland. And then you know, all these men wading through that fire. And then those guys, they, they just burnt to a crisp, most of them. The fire, that oil burning. And they were trying to, trying to keep that far away from it. It's impossible. And actually, I saw a fire coming, started to come through the two, two ships. And I, I didn't want to jump in the water. For those that dove into the water, some men got away with minor burns, but there were some men that were grotesquely burned. When I decided to swim for it, there's six inches of oil on the water, so it was pretty tough swimming. That oil is just thick like tar, you know. I'd swim like this and shoot the flames to the side. I looked around to see where I was going to go, and I spotted the airplane. The battleships were all equipped with float planes, and one of them is blown off of the catapult on board the ship that would launch the aircraft and was resting in the water. I finally made it to the airplane and grabbed a hold of the pontoon. You have men swimming through burning water while the enemy's strafing. They were scraping. And one fella that we know was just about cut in two with uh, bullets. Some men survived by crawling along lines where the ships tied off to one another. The Maryland was next to us, and I saw all those lines. That's when I made my big leap, and I caught one of those lines. You'd be surprised what you can do. He never did it before. Some men reach the relative safety of the deck of USS Maryland, but that ship is still under attack. They got on the Maryland, went over to the 1.1 any aircraft guns, helped pass ammunition while they were firing at the planes. I didn't see anything except those planes flying over. The Type 97 torpedo bomber was called a Kate. Now, the Cates were divided into two different missions. You had the Cates that delivered huge bombs from high above. And then you had the Cates that delivered torpedoes low on the water. One of the challenges facing the Japanese was how to drop torpedoes from the air into such a shallow harbor. The Americans at Pearl Harbor thought, well, we won't have a torpedo attack here because torpedoes will go 50 feet, so, you know, we're safe. Over and over again, they were told that the harbor at Pearl was too shallow for the use of the aerial torpedo. But the Japanese naval engineers were pretty sharp. Well, the torpedo bomber Cates had specially adapted torpedoes with these plywood wooden fins. And once the torpedo hit the water, the box fin would break off, and it would cause a slight delay, which allowed the nose to come up. So it kept the torpedo from sinking into the mud. These particular torpedoes were incredibly accurate. They stayed pretty close to the surface. And because of that, their impact was devastating. Oklahoma takes most of her damage on the port side. The water quickly overwhelms the ship, and the ship begins to capsize. I could look up and see the ship coming over. When you see that much decking and stuff coming at you, you're going to have to make a move. It would have hit me if I hadn't have swam away. The mass kept it from going all the way over when it hit the dirt on the bottom of the bay. It just settled right there. So we were looking at the bottom of the starboard side. As soon as they closed that big hatch, I knew a lot of them were trapped down there. I couldn't get out. The man closing the hatches, I imagine he disappeared as soon as the ship started capsizing.
There was no way to go anywhere else. I couldn't see anything. Ship turned over, water started coming in. There was a big spring-loaded hatch there. And when they dropped that hatch down, there wasn't a way you could get out. We were there. That was it. When most people think of the attack on Pearl Harbor, they, they think of the airplanes. Not too many people think of submarines in the harbor. There were five midget subs, a brand new secret weapon that the US didn't know about. Their instructions were to sit on the bottom, wait till the aerial attack was over, and then rise up and take out whatever was left. The history that we've known to date it has no submarine actually accomplishing anything during the attack. Several of these surprise weapons were blown from the water by direct hits of our naval gunners. Others were beached and captured. And then we find this midget sub, three pieces outside the harbor. It's fired its torpedoes. So if, in fact, this torpedo did get into the harbor and hit Oklahoma, did it affect the way Oklahoma sank? That's the question that we're grappling with now. This photo started some controversies about the possibility the submarine, represented by this dark spot in the photo here, actually got into the channel and fired uh, much more powerful torpedoes under the side of Oklahoma than were dropped by the, uh, the aircraft. That really looks like a midget sub to me. I'm really convinced that she was hit by that larger torpedo. What I was looking for was damage that would be consistent with the destructive power of the submarine-launched torpedo warhead. The only ship that I found damaged caused by a 800-pound torpedo is Oklahoma. When we, when we looked at the torpedo analysis, Oklahoma and West Virginia took a similar number of hits. Because of where they were situated, Battleship Row, they sucked up the most torpedoes by the bombers coming in. The interesting thing, though, is that West Virginia eventually settled onto an even keel. So why didn't Oklahoma? I think she was condemned to capsizing. But she might have stayed afloat another, you know, five or 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes if that torpedo hadn't hit. A key difference between the two ships is the West Virginia, when you look at the damage, uh, her armor belt is intact. 13 inches of solid steel. Oklahoma, though, has got much more severe damage. At least 50 feet of her armor belt is just simply gone. They had all the watertight doors open, so no watertight boundary set is the reason given for her fast settling and capsizing. So you get the water starting to come in here through damage here. The survivability of this ship was all based on the idea that there would be active damage control. This kind of massive at attack was just never envisioned. I'm thinking of something more dramatic. The first inquiries did talk about a submarine in the harbor. The first newsreel showed the Oklahoma and said a two-man submarine sank it. At low tide, the huge propeller of the Oklahoma, filled by the enemy, was high above water. It is believed that the small two-man Jap submarines carrying dual torpedo tubes were responsible for these two losses to our Pacific fleet. I mean, I'm personally very convinced that a midget sub did hit the Oklahoma. But what I'm not convinced is that a capsizing scenario tells us anything about it. So far in this case, the evidence is telling a different story than the one that we're used to. We found and identified a midget sub. Then we have other evidence, photographic, eyewitness descriptions, that when you put the pieces of the puzzle together, there was a Japanese midget sub that got inside the harbor and fired its torpedoes at Battleship Row. 
what I believe right now is that torpedo hit Oklahoma right at the moment when she could have either continued capsizing or righting herself. Nothing like this had happened before for the United States. In one attack, we had lost nearly 200 combat aircraft, 21 warships sunk or damaged, 2,400 Americans killed, and there are those who lose their lives on board Oklahoma, but not on December 7th, 1941. You could look across the bay and see all these guys on the bottom of the Oklahoma, walking back and forth. As the attack wanes, they start to hear people banging on the hull. And these are men who are trapped in these, these compartments below decks, and they're taking wrenches, they're taking flashlights, and they're banging Morse code, trying to alert people. We took turns beating on the bulkheads. Some of them said they were using the code. I wasn't using the code. I just beat the hell out of the bulkhead. My uncle was down there. He said they tapped from one compartment to the next. As soon as the water got up to their neck where they couldn't breathe, then they open up another hatch. And pretty soon, rescue crews are there. They try using blow torches to cut through the hull of the ship. Some of them try to use settle-in torches to get them out. So they get, eventually get high-intensity drills and begin first to pop a lot of air holes in so the people can survive that way. Then they started using chipping hammers. We were quite a ways from the ship. But if you stepped outside, you could hear the chipping hammers going. The only air we had or anything to breathe was the air in the compartment. There's oil. You could smell this oil, too. That didn't help. After a while, you could just taste this oil. I had no idea what time it was. We could hear people coming on the ship. You could hear people talking. The guy said, take it easy now. We're going to get you out of there. Hey, I don't know what else we could do, but take it easy. <laughs> we weren't going nowhere. They eventually begin to cut the plates away and to pull men out. They came for people in the emergency radio room. It was in the forward compartment from us in the next space. We heard them take those guys out. We could hear them talking. Then they left. Well, I said, they're taking a coffee break. They'll be back. I was 19 and a half years old, and I was a gung-ho sailor. So I never thought that I wouldn't get out. How they survived on the water, I don't know. Especially when you're in a compartment upside down. They came through the starboard blister, and there was four compartments. They came through four spaces, then they got down to us. People were grabbing a hold on me, pulling me from one place to the other. When I got up top side, they say, oh my God, what a mess. And I remember saying that. And they was ships of smoking and people in the water still. You could still hear pounding on the Oklahoma for several days after that. People that was trapped inside. But they were afraid to cut any more holes in it because of gas. And they didn't want another big explosion or anything in the harbor, so that was it. Uh, the rest of the people that was trapped in it, they, they just didn't make it. Yeah, you never forget that. Yeah. In the end, 32 men are rescued by being cut out of the ship. But we couldn't save everybody. At some day between December 7th and about December 20th, they expire because they're, they have no food, they have no fresh water. 
they suffocate in some cases. It's the additional tragedy of that ship's experience. My parents, well, naturally, on December 7, 1941, they had their ears to the radio trying to find out, you know, what was going on. I was eight years old at the time, and they kind of sent me off to friends, you know, get me out of the way, I guess. December 20th is when my parents got a first telegram from the Navy saying that my brother was missing in action. The Navy Department deeply regrets to inform you that your son, Lowell Earl Valley, Fireman Second Class, U.S. Navy, is missing following action in the performance of his duty. JC's parents did not get the official telegram stating that he was missing in action until the middle of December. And obviously, when any family gets that type of news, um, they're in shock. Uh, my great-grandmother refused to believe it, along with my grandmother. They just held out hope. You know, he's hurt. He'll call when he can. Mom's birthday was actually December 20th, and she turned six. On that day, the telegram arrived to tell her mother, our grandmother, that he was missing in action. I'm not sure if his mother really ever accepted that he had died. I think she really thought he would come home and that, you know, it was just be a matter of time before he would walk through the door. In the aftermath of Pearl Harbor, there's thousands of people that are either killed or injured. Bodies are turning up all over the place, in the, in the water, along the shoreline. And so some kind of rapid system has to be developed about you know, collecting these bodies, identifying them. Not all these bodies are whole. Many of them spend days or weeks underwater, so they're utterly unrecognizable. So they're trying to figure out how to sort this out. There is also a massive effort to salvage warships Again, a 24-hour, around-the-clock job of salvage and repair that will stand forever as one of the great achievements in maritime history. This will ultimately see certain ships returned to service. It's a Herculean effort to salvage the Oklahoma. The efforts were undertaken to roll the ship to see if it could be salvaged, because they were desperate to put any ships back in service. When they write that ship in 1943, all that's really left are skeletal remains, and many of them are mixed. This is a tragedy. These are sailors who have died heroes, but sorting out each bone is technologically difficult, and also it's really not a priority. The priority is winning the war. And so they're eventually just buried in a local cemetery, and it's not really clear how many people are buried there, and in some cases, which remains are which. So a lot of the families who lost loved ones on the Oklahoma, they received word that their loved ones were lost, but they never received any remains. There was never any opportunity to, to, to bear, properly bury uh, their loved ones. My parents were devastated, and they did not want to give up hope that somewhere along the line he would show up. There were situations where, oh, that they would see a picture in the paper, and they said, well, that looks like Lowell and they try to follow up on that. They were contacting local congressmen, representatives from our area, and uh, they would get a hold of the Navy, and then, of course, the Navy couldn't tell them anything. So they really didn't know anything what was going on. My great-grandparents never had real closure. Are these really all unknowns, really? All the ones with the white things are all unknown. They really needed a body or, or something to bury, um, a place to go mourn. I think my grandmother never really dealt with it, which passed it on to my mom, which my mom, in a way, passed on to my sister and I. I know my family never had closure uh, for generations. World War II produced an enormous number of missing in actions. In fact, probably the largest number it in any of our wars. And of the number of MIAs, there are many hundreds, in fact. Their remains are on US soil. 
My sister and I grew up knowing that he was a Pearl Harbor hero. We knew he died on the Oklahoma. But really, that was about it. Uh, I knew nothing of the person that he was. Uh, I, I, I'd seen a picture of him, but that was it. In 2004, my cousin Katie was cleaning out her parents' attic and found two huge boxes of all of my grandfather's things. So I pretty much started my journey there to get to know my grandfather. Okay, so this is actually one of my very favorite things of my grandfather's. Um, it's his high school uh, notebook. It has his classes, his economics class, his philosophy class. I think this might have been his senior year. He's in California at Alhambra High School. He loved Oklahoma and always wanted to serve aboard the USS Oklahoma. He would go back for summers with his grandparents. Damned Oki. <laughs> He definitely loved that state. We had 429 casualties on the Oklahoma. 35 of those were identified between 1941 and 1949 and were returned home to the families for burial. 394 were the leftovers, and those were all missing in action. They buried them first in two naval cemeteries, and in 49 is when the Punchbowl Cemetery was created, better known as the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. So after these Oklahoma unknowns were at first buried in a local cemetery, they were then exhumed and buried in the Punchbowl. And there were rumors that some had been maybe identified, maybe, maybe not. So there were family members, descendants, who were lobbying uh, the government to put forward an effort to uh, identify these remains. They hired Dr. Mildred Trotter, the anthropologist, and she started to identify what she could through dental records. At that time, we had 27 of our casualties recommended by the American Graves Registration Service to be given individual identification. And so that was when the decision was made um, by the Quartermaster General to put the 27th in with the unknowns. In 2002, Ray Emery discovered these 27 from the Oklahoma were originally identified but buried as unknowns. He asked me if I could find the relatives of these 27 casualties. So this is when I went to work. I get the email from Bob Valley stating that my grandfather is one of 27 men that were actually positively identified and then buried with the unknowns. I had no idea. I mean, it was a complete shock to me when I read that email. I had no clue. We were shocked to see his name on the list. We had not really heard a lot about the list. Then once we learned more about the list, it was frustrating to us that they could have given our mother and grandmother the closure that they really needed back in 1947. But um, not having been there at the time and knowing the difficulties of identifying all of the casualties, we kind of gave them a pass on that and were hopeful that they would uh, continue the identification process and at least do it in our lifetime. Quickly, bud. The funeral will be the final chapter in his return home. And I think that way we will have him resting in peace, finally. I never thought this would actually happen. I know. I didn't either. Well, he's ours now. Yeah.
with every passing decade, new technology, whether it's DNA or x-rays, the ability to identify remains has really advanced. So there's a lot of hope this could happen for lots of families who lost loved ones on the Oklahoma. So after we got all the information about him being one of the 27, we got our DNA sample kit, did the cheek swab for the Navy. That was probably in 2009. So it's been seven years. Dear Grandma, well, how does it feel to have a granddaughter? I bet she's about the prettiest baby that ever was, huh? Dad, I'll pass the cigars out to you the next time I see you. All my love to you all, Cappy included, which was their dog. <laughs> and think about me at Christmas, because I'll be wishing like the devil that I was with you. Love, JC. This whole process has been a lot of waiting. We had no idea what our ending was going to be. He was a handsome guy, huh? And people didn't really celebrate his life like they should have, you know, things that you do at a funeral. Today, we are getting our official visit from the Navy that my great-grandparents would have had if my grandfather's remains would have been recovered back in the 40s. So this is a meeting 75 years in the waiting. Hello. Hi. Bethy? That's me. And Chief Swope. Chief Swope, nice to meet you. Hey, Chief Robert. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Come on in. OK. Thank you. A couple of things we have here. This is yours. It has a historical report, kind of explains what took place on, on December 7th, uh, what happened with the USS Oklahoma. It goes into what forensic studies were done back then to try and uh, make an effort to do identification. Of course, back in 1941, they didn't have the DNA, they didn't have the technology that they have today, and that's why this is a lot of this is getting down, done. We treat them as if this is an act of duty death that occurred today. A full uniform will be draped over the remains. OK. Because that's how they should be taken care of and honored. We really appreciate what you guys are doing. It was such a taboo subject in my family. My mm -hmm. grandfather was such pain. And um, I'm happy to be able to just kind of celebrate his life now. It seems right. like we've mourned him for so long. Well, if you have any questions, please call. I will, absolutely. Thank you so it much. Was nice meeting you. You too, All absolutely. Right. We'll stay in touch. OK. All right. Travel. Safe. It seems like after this visit, it solidifies it more that this is really happening, <laughs> you know? And it'll be real, I think, once the funeral comes. The date that we're shooting for is August 13th. So that's our next journey. So we're halfway there, Grandpa. <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> The attack on Pearl Harbor united Americans as never before in history. In With December 7, 1941, the United States has thrust into war, a war that the U.S. was attempting to avoid. There are millions of Americans who, on December 6, 1941, were adamantly in favor of neutrality. And you know, a day later, they were adamantly and enthusiastically all in on the fact that the war had come to us and we have no choice, we've got to go. Those battles, they just don't leave you. For some reason, it's in your brain, it's not going to leave. I think when you think about battle, you think about losing somebody. And that's, that's the hard part, yeah. How come it's not me instead of him? You wonder about it, you know. They never got out of that handling room. They went down with the ship, and a lot of them. Then the ones that are actually trapped in it, they didn't get them cut out until the next day. How they made it out, and the rest of them didn't, you know. 
Yeah, you think about that a lot. The Japanese pilots that I met all said that they thought that a declaration of war had been delivered at least 30 minutes before the attack. They thought it was a one-way mission. They thought that there'd be battleships waiting for them, uh, bombers, aircraft in the air. So they thought they weren't coming home. Now I, I look back, well, I know we killed quite a few of your Japanese. And those young kids, they're all young kids. They came in this service when they were like me, 19 years old or younger. And uh, to me, when they were got, got killed, uh, they just didn't have a life. You think about that. All the people that were killed in just a few hours, nobody expected it. The fate of USS Oklahoma was supposed to be the scrapyard. The ship was being towed to a scrapping yard in 1947, but for whatever ethereal reason, during a storm, her lines broke and her hull sank. And, and isn't that an interesting final resting place, somewhere between Oahu and San Diego? And maybe that's the better fate for that warship. The decision to pursue my grandfather's remains was not an easy one to make. I questioned whether we wanted to open the old emotional wounds that World War II had inflicted upon my family. We suffer in a way that only families left without a sense of closure could possibly understand. It's a sadness that seems to drape over the generations. We want to thank you for joining us today as we lay to rest the final remains of my grandfather, John Charles Ingram, or as his friends and family called him, JC. Our mom died in 2002, six years before we found out about her father. My sister Lisa and I decided to include her ashes in her father's grave as a way to heal the past and bring a long-awaited closure to our family. We want to thank the Navy and everyone for paying their respects to a young man like so many from the greatest generation was taken far too soon. Ma'am, on behalf of the President of the United States, a grateful nation and a proud Navy, it's my honor to present this flag as a token of appreciation for your grandfather's loyal heroic and dedicated service to our country. That's why that's We are willing to do anything to help others in their quest because we know how wonderful it is to finally have that goal achieved. Most of my friends that I know from the USS Oklahoma of the 27 have been notified that their person has been identified. Now the ones who weren't the 27, I haven't heard of any of those yet, but that's what we'll continue to hope for. I'm still waiting for that phone call. I'm hoping that it's going to happen.
Pearl Harbor, USS Oklahoma. The final story is available on DVD. To order, call 866-260-WCVE.